Sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never harm me. Anybody's parents besides mine teach them that? Yeah? It's the way to fight the bullies, right? Sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never harm me. What a bunch of bull that is. <laughs> Words are some of the sharpest weapons we have. Words can kill the soul. Words can stamp out hope. Make no mistake about it, friends. Words are weapons. But then again, so are sticks and stones. Today's lesson from the book of Acts is the conclusion of a much longer story about the very first Christian martyr man named Stephen. I chose this text mostly because I had never preached on it before, and it seemed like a challenge to me. But after I had chosen it and written the order of worship and Doug had planned the music, I realized that being killed for one's faith is a rather odd choice for New Member Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> you all didn't know what you were signed up for, did you? It's also an odd text to preach on because, quite frankly, it's so far removed from our experience. Can you imagine, honest to God, can you imagine your faith costing you anything today? Let alone your life. In addition to that, the whole notion of martyrdom has been horribly tainted in our post-9-11 world. The hijackers who rained down terror on Lower Manhattan and Washington, D.C., and the Pennsylvania countryside and the whole United States were, at least in their own minds, martyrs. Suicide bombers, in their own minds, are martyrs. Since the lesson today, that very short lesson that Matt read for us, is the end of a much longer story, let me give you the cliff notes of the rest of it, because it's important. The setting of the story is in the very first days of the fledgling Christian movement. And as the church grew, and it grew very quickly, so did the responsibilities of the twelve apostles. As in all church growth, there came this tipping point at which they simply could not do the work anymore. There was too much to do. In particular, there was a dispute between the Jewish Christians and the Greek-speaking Christians. And the Greek-speaking Christians complained that in the food line, their widows were getting gypped. They weren't getting enough food. And so they called in the apostles to settle the score, and the apostles decided that they would choose instead seven deacons to settle the score. It was the job of the deacons to make sure that the food was distributed fairly. And that, my friends, is still what modern deacons do in churches that have them. They attend to the physical needs of the congregation. One of those original deacons was named Stephen. And the book of Acts says that Stephen was full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit, and basically that was the only requirement for being a deacon. Now remember also that almost all of the early Christians were Jews. And so there was this growing tension in the synagogues between the Jews who followed Jesus and the Jews who didn't. In the midst of that tension, people got feisty, people wanted their own way, and people, as people are wont to do, began to gossip and spread rumors. And one of the target of their rumors was Stephen. They claimed, without any cause, that he had committed blasphemy, cursing Moses and the temple, which in that day was a capital offense. And so they seized him, and they dragged him into the religious court. When he was given a chance to speak in his own defense, right or wrong, good or bad, Stephen didn't. He just decided to preach a sermon, and he preached a sermon that nobody wanted to hear. 
He reminded his fellow Jews, and remember, he is a Jew. He reminded his fellow Jews that over the centuries, God had sent the people of Israel many prophets. And lots of those prophets, Stephen said, ended up dead. God sent another prophet named Jesus, but like the others, he paid the price for speaking truth to power. And it is at that climactic moment in the story that the lesson from Acts comes in. When the leaders of the religious council heard Stephen accuse them of killing off the prophets, and then Stephen claiming to have a vision of Jesus seated at the right hand of God, they were wild with rage. And a mob mentality took over, and mobs are almost always dangerous. This mob rushed Stephen. Imagine the drama. They're in this religious court. The whole mob rushes Stephen and drag him out of the city to stone him. It was the custom when you stone someone to shove him or her over the ledge, a little cliff, a little hill, and they would fall. And before they could get up, you would rain down stones upon them. Their head was always the target. And I cannot talk about this kind of awfulness without reminding you all that people in the 21st century still die this way. How far have we come? Standing in the crowd that day, not stoning Stephen, but holding the coats of those who were, was a man named Saul. And this guy would later be converted and given a name change we know him as the Apostle Paul, St. Paul, but that's a totally different story for a different Sunday. Stephen's story ends very much like another story that we all know very well, a story that you all listen to during Holy Week. You will remember that on the cross, Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. In the same way as he was dying, Acts reports that Stephen said, do not hold this sin against them. Isn't that remarkable? Now you all know that I am very fond of saying that the Bible's stories are really our stories, right? They're humanity stories. That when we read the stories of the Bible, we ought to look for ourselves in those stories. So where are we in this story, if you think we're in here at all? Are we the martyrs? Some people think so, but I'm not one of them. Even in a so-called post-Christian America, we Christians still enjoy the benefits of those who dominate the culture. And yet sometimes, those who claim to be the persecuted Christians of this country are in actuality the oppressors. Watch cable news sometime and you will see the talking heads of the religious right claiming to be discriminated against and persecuted while at the same time the organizations with which they are represented are working furiously to persecute gay people, and Muslims, and atheists, and women, and immigrants, and the list goes on and on. So no, folks, we're not the martyrs. I suppose it's possible that we could be the religious authorities, right? Here we are in church. <laughs> They're the people who are so interested in preserving the status quo that they refuse to hear any idea that might challenge what they already believe. So when a new voice enters the mix, these folks put their hands over their ears and push that person out the door as quickly as possible. But I don't really think that's us either. We're not perfect, but I think we do try, most of the time, to listen to people who might differ from us. 
And hopefully we won't push you off a cliff because you say something that challenges the pastors or the board of stewards or the way things have always been done. Could we be Saul? Saul never threw a stone, but in his silence he was as guilty as those who murdered Stephen. He was a witness to violence, and he never said a word. He facilitated evil by doing nothing. So Saul gets a little closer to home for me, because sometimes I'm silent. I don't know why Saul was silent that day, but I suspect that I am silent on some days simply because I'm overwhelmed. In our worldwide, instantaneously connected lives, we see the suffering of humanity live. It leaves us overloaded and overburdened and feeling helpless, and we want to hide, and we feel numb, and we are silent because we don't know what else to do. But there's another potential character in this story. And I think that this character, this hidden character, is really more than any of the other ones directly related to us. This is the character who lives in the world of what might have happened that day. Among all the people who stood in that crowd, do you think that at least one of them thought that this was a great injustice? And is it possible that in that kind of situation, someone might dare to be brave enough to stand between the accused and the stones? Could someone have stopped the cycle of violence that day by putting her body between the angry mob and the innocent man? There are people like that. They're all over the world. Most are unsung, anonymous people who do the right thing for those who can't. Perhaps you are among them. And then there are the much better known ones. It could be said that Martin Luther King Jr. simply got in the way of the bullets that were meant for every uppity black person in this country. It could be said that Archbishop Oscar Romero simply got in the way of the bullets that were meant for all the poor people in El Salvador who dared to demand bread and dignity. It could be said that Dietrich Bonhoeffer got in the way of the gallows and the gas chamber meant for all the Jews. In doing so, these people and others like them became martyrs. Do you know what that word really means? And this is really important to understand the story of Stephen. The word is taken from the Greek language. The word is martus and simply means witness. They were witnesses. And what did they witness to these people? They were witnesses to the power of love over hate. They were witnesses to the power of life over death. For Jesus and Stephen, they were witnesses to the power of forgiveness as they were dying. All of these people are witnesses that bullets and crosses and stones and words and sticks and bombs and bullets can never stop the power of resurrection as it is displayed in love and acts of justice. They cannot stop it. Now, to seek to be a martyr is madness. And to 
seek suffering is to be a masochist. The gospel of Jesus does not call any of us to look for pain. It is a perversion of the gospel to think so, but the gospel of Jesus does call us to stand in the gap, to speak up for the voiceless, to cry out against all the powers in this world that seek continuously to crush the poor and the lowly of the earth and to send our children to war and to keep us silent about it. Earlier in this service, we recited together the statement of faith of the United Church of Christ. And what is it that we said we believe? What does God expect of us? Simply this, and I quote what we all so freely said together. You call us into your church to accept the cost and joy of discipleship. To be your servants in the service of others. To proclaim the gospel to all the world and resist the powers of evil. So God help me to resist the powers better. God help us all to resist the powers more effectively. And in doing so, to point with our lives and our service and our witness, to point toward that love, which triumphs always, Overall, thanks be to God. Amen.